Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, our reconstructive urologic surgeon, Dr. Andrew Cohen, will be speaking about improving your urinary quality of life. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenter. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check sent anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Andrew Cohen to begin our presentation. Thanks everyone. It's a, it's a real privilege to be able to uh, chat with you uh, about a topic that I'm, I'm very passionate about, which is urinary stricture disease. And so I'm the Director of Trauma and Reconstructive Urologic Surgery here at, uh, at the Brady at Johns Hopkins. And, uh, and I hope today is an informative session for, uh, for everyone. Uh, I don't really have any relevant financial disclosures pertinent to the topics that we're going to discuss today, but any pictures that are in this presentation uh, were uh, provided very graciously by my patients, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate them for that. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about strictures, and that by definition in the dictionary is an, an abnormal narrowing of a bodily passage. Uh, and, and we're talking about this in the context of the flow of urine, the flow of a fluid. And, and this can get kind of complicated, uh, but I, I'm sort of a simple-minded guy. And so we're not gonna worry about vectors and, and vorticity and various other physics notions of the flow of fluid here. What we're gonna look at is sort of a more simple example and think about it like water coming out of a hose. So if you think about, it doesn't really matter how much you open up the spigot of your hose. If it's completely cinched down and you, you've kinked it off, no fluid is gonna come through there, no matter, no matter how much you turn up the faucet. And you can do the same thing at the end of the hose. If you really put your thumb in the hole, simply you're gonna be able to completely block the flow. And if you have it, partially blocked with your thumb, then all sorts of weird things can happen with the water that comes out. And it's this same idea and this same uh, situation that happens inside the human body in the urinary system. And we're going to talk about that today. Uh, and so first, we're going to review the anatomy of the urinary system. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, how often these sorts of problems happen and where they happen. That's the epidemiology. Then we're going to talk about what can what may cause these problems, and that's etiology. We're going to discuss some common symptoms and why someone may suspect they have one of these problems and what would make them go to a doctor or what would make a doctor concerned that they had one of these issues. We're going to talk about how one would figure out, confirm the diagnosis, and then what one would do about this type of problem. And then after it's treated or identified, what is what is the the uh, the follow up plan? What sort of surveillance, if any, is common uh, for this type of situation? Um, and so let's get started with a little uh, review of anatomy. Um, and so this this is a picture, kind of a fancy three D reconstructed image of uh, of a, a general uh, urinary anatomic system, and we divide this sort of into an upper and lower urinary tract. And so the upper urinary tract is essentially the uh, pink structure up on the top, the kidney, and the tube that drains the kidney called the ureter. And I'll label that in a minute so everyone can understand and remember what I'm talking about. And then the lower urinary tract is the bladder where the urine is stored and anything closer to the exit. And so again, the upper urinary tract is the kidney and the kidney, to remind everyone, that's the organ that sort of filters through the liquid in your body and generates the urine. 
It also has some uh, function for blood pressure control, for the development of red blood cells and signaling to develop red blood cells, but primarily it filters uh, out the, the toxins that become part of the urine. And once the urine is created, it, it is collected in this ureter, which is a dynamic tube, very thin. If you're sitting by a computer and you have a mouse cord that's plugged into your computer, the ureter is typically about the size of that mouse cord. So it's a pretty delicate little tube inside the body. Uh, and so that ureter tube then plugs into the bladder which is another dynamic vessel. It's able to fill and empty as, uh, as one collects urine throughout the day. And then the urethra is the exit. And in females, the urethra is quite short. And in males, the urethra has its own complexity. And, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's, let's look at sort of the various areas in the urinary system and look at sort of what can go wrong and the, the epidemiology of this problem. So sort of starting at the top, um, you know, where the kidney and the ureter meet is a specific location that we've named the ureteral pelvic junction. And having a scar or stricture or obstruction in that area is relatively common among men and women. And it can be something that is discovered during childhood or develops later in life. Um, but that's called a UPJ obstruction for short. Um, and while we're talking about strictures, uh, I'm, I'm stretching sort of the definition a little bit for the purposes of this talk, but the UPJ obstruction is not necessarily a stricture because it can, it can happen because of something pressing on the outside of the tube. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I think we can just consider any form of narrowing, whether it's inside the tube or outside the tube, a stricture for, for today's discussion. And then the ureter tube, which is a very delicate tube, as I mentioned, that can become injured for many reasons and stricture off, but one of the more common reasons is because of stone disease. So kidney stones are very common, especially in the United States, given some of our tendencies in diet are not the best and the healthiest. And there is an association between kidney stone disease and scar tissue forming inside the ureter. And whether the stone gets stuck in there and leads to the scar formation, or whether the scar was there beforehand and that actually caused the stone, sometimes it's a little hard to say, but there's a definite association and lots of stone is in this country. And so, you know, 1% of stone procedures uh, leading to the identification of a stricture is actually a fair number of these cases that we uh, encounter. And then the next area that can have a problem is where the ureter hooks up into the bladder. Uh, and that's called a ureteral vesicle junction obstruction. That's relatively rare outside of childhood. Uh, the next area that can have a problem is within the bladder itself, where the bladder comes to a, to a connection spot with the urethra down below. That's called the bladder neck. And that area can get scarred off. And that's a specific type of scar called a bladder neck contracture. And that is most commonly seen for patients, both men and women, who have a history of radiation for treatment of cancers in the pelvis or who've had surgery in the urinary system in the past. Um, the posterior urethra is just outside of the bladder neck, a little bit more towards the urethra. And that is an area that's commonly injured during car accidents. Uh, and this is um, luckily in the United States, of decreased incidence because of the safety uh, improvements that have been, have been implemented in the last few decades, but particularly worldwide where um, perhaps there is a less use of seat belts, less use of um, less use or availability of airbags and whatnot. This is one of the most common causes globally of scars in, in uh, the urinary system. And then the urethra itself can uh, be a source of strictures. And it's estimated that you know, just under 1% of men can develop a stricture within the urethra. Um, and for women, it's much, much more rare uh, to find a stricture there. And so you know, the male urethra is a little bit longer than the female urethra. There's more anatomy there. And this, this figure is just to show you that there are many different types, subtypes, subclassifications, and very subtle differences within the male urethra into how we describe and potentially diagnose uh, these strictures based on their location and other characteristics. 
So, you know, to give you a sense of, of how these strictures may actually look to make it more tangible, let's look inside the urinary system. So this is pictures looking with a camera inside a urinary system. And in particular, this is looking inside a urethra. And on the left on your screen, you'll see what is a normal urethra. It's pink, it's healthy. You see those little red spots that indicate that there's good blood flow to the area. And I think everyone will recognize, especially in comparison to the picture on the right, that the one on the left is wide open. On the other hand, the other picture is what I would describe as a pinhole. And the tissue is white. Uh, it does not look like it has good blood flow. And this, this looks like some sort of scar type tissue. Uh, and whenever I see this type of picture in a patient, I always wonder my, to myself, how are they able to get any urine out of through this urethra? It's such a small hole. And so this is a pretty severe problem. And so how this might affect someone functionally, think about it like your drain in the tub at home. If it's clogged with hair, it's not going down very fast. Uh, and so that's the same situation for the unfortunate patient on the right, where, you know, the urine is just not going to come out very fast. And, uh, and, and that's the experience that people sometimes uh, describe. Um, so let's talk for a moment about what may cause this problem. What, what are the potential etiologies of these scars? Um, so there's many different causes. Um, so congenital means that some people are born with these issues. So in particular, men and women that have a ureteral pelvic uh, junction obstruction, that is something that often is identified in childhood. Um, it can also be found later in life, and it's not always symptomatic, uh, but there are congenital or essentially things that one is born with that can lead to difficulties in the flow of urine and these scar tissues to develop. Uh, another example in, in men is some an entity called posterior urethral valves, which is a obstructive process within the urethra. Now, trauma is a very common cause of issues in the urinary tract that lead to scar tissue. Um, and as I mentioned, the ureter is a very delicate little tube. And so you can imagine that during an unfortunate motor vehicle accident, uh, that any sort of, uh, you know, bruise or strike to that area could cause um, issues with blood flow and then scar development. Uh, there are a number of inflammatory causes. Those are causes related to some sort of infection. Um, for example, in the urethra, sexually transmitted infections are associated with urethral stricture disease. And there are certain skin conditions, one of which is called lichen sclerosis, that has an association with the formation of these types of scars. Um, Unfortunately, cancer and malignancy is a, a cause of some of these obstructions, uh, whether a cancer is very close to one of these structures, whether it's uh, involving one of these structures, that can lead to scarring and obstruction. Iatrogenic means it's something that resulted from medical care. So uh, for instance, uh, someone that uh, receives radiation to treat a cancer that's very close, to, say, to the ureter, uh, that then develops stricture, you know, that is iatrogenic. That was caused potentially by the radiation. Unavoidable because the cancer needed to be treated, and it's a known risk that around radiation, scar tissue can develop. So, um, but nonetheless, the, that patient would not have had a scar if they never had the radiation treatment. Um, similarly, during stone surgery, uh, you know, there's a known sort of 1% risk of developing a scar from the treatment of a kidney stone, uh, whether it was there before because the stone was stuck in that area and so someone was at risk versus whether it was the intervention itself that caused it. A little hard to say, uh, but certainly uh, in some ways related to the treatment that was necessary and so again sort of unavoidable. And then many times these scars are idiopathic. And by that, I mean, we don't really know why they form or we can't really pinpoint to a specific instance or uh, a specific uh, you know, traumatic memory can't be recalled by a patient. Uh, nonetheless, we detect them and we need to, to treat them. So what may cause these scars? So you know, there are a few mechanisms that are under investigation, but just in very general terms, there's some sort of inciting factor uh, in the urinary plumbing 
that leads to some sort of chronic inflammatory state. And that inflammatory state leads to changes in what types of cells are in the area and how these tissues are pliable and elastic. And ultimately, instead of having nice, healthy, supple tissues, there's some sort of scar formation that replaces the normal. And so let's move on and talk about what people may experience when they have these types of, of scars. And I'll discuss this relative to the upper and then lower urinary tract. So someone that has an issue higher up in the system, closer to the kidney, it's gonna have sort of kidney-centric type symptoms. So that may involve pain in the flank. That's essentially referred pain from the kidney. They may notice blood in the urine. If their kidney is really backed up, they may even notice sort of an abdominal mass. They may feel a fullness uh, over where the kidney is. They can have unexplained fevers, a decreased urine output. Um, they may experience some nausea, some vomiting. They're at a higher risk for stones because the urine is stagnant. For the same reason, there's a higher risk of infection, urinary infection, again, because the urine is stagnant. And then if, if this goes on long enough, uh, it's not recognized early enough, you know, we can see some pretty significant kidney dysfunction. Now it's important to value, be evaluated by a doctor because many of these symptoms are are very general and they may indicate some other issue or concern. And so, you know, if you're having any of these symptoms, you do need to be fully evaluated and, and make sure that the right diagnosis is made. Uh, if the symptom, if the stricture's closer to the lower urinary tract, then the symptoms are gonna be more uh, relatable to one's urinary quality of life on a daily basis. So you may notice a decrease in your urinary stream. There may be less uh, sense that you're emptying your bladder completely when you go to the bathroom. Again, there may be blood in the urine. The stream may be spraying. Think about like the hose when you put your thumb on it. Uh, there may be a, a real sense of difficulty of straining to get it out. One can experience the sense that you have to urgently run to the restroom uh, and as well as getting up at night a lot or nocturia. There can even be a lack of control or leakage. And just like with the upper urinary tract because of stagnant urine, there's a risk of stones and infection, and again, kidney dysfunction if severe enough. So let's talk about if this is suspected, what a physician may do to diagnose these issues. And so, you know, any physician is going to do a full history and physical exam in order to uh, tease out what's been going on in your life and what risk factors are present. And then they'll probably consider some form of urine analysis to rule out common things like uh, infection. Uh, we have a lot of validated patient reported outcome measures in the form of quality of life surveys that can be very helpful in letting us understand how much the symptoms are, uh, are affecting your life. And then we have some non-invasive diagnostic testing, one of which is called post-void residual testing. And in that test, we have you urinate in the clinical office, and then we do a, a very um, quick ultrasound on your lower abdomen to see how well you're emptying your bladder. Similarly, there's a test called a Euroflow, which I can show you the output of, lets us see basically the flow rate. It, it lets us sort of test how well the water is coming out of your hose. Uh, and we can compare this to what we, what we know to be normal. And it gives us a hint as to whether you are voiding in an obstructive way and or if your bladder is functioning appropriately. So, uh, but to really confirm and understand the diagnosis, we need to do more specific testing once we're thinking about a stricture. And that involves some form of imaging test. And so a retrograde uh, urethrogram is an, essentially an X-ray that lets us look at the urethra. A pilogram is the uh, similar image test for the kidney. Uh, cystoscopy is using one of our small cameras to actually look inside the urinary tract. And then alternately, some, uh, some find that an ultrasound is useful for the diagnosis or other uh, CT or MRI type modalities. So this is an example uh, from a, a female patient of a very typical uh, UPJ obstruction. And so I've tried to highlight here that the kidney is sort of in this area, and then the ureter is this tube that you can see here, and it's filled with this dark material of contrast, 
the kidney also, this is sort of the dark material of contrast. And I'm going to highlight here that there's a small area where there's really a very thin amount of contrast. It's a very thin tube here all of a sudden. It's wide over here and wide over here. And this represents a, the UPJ obstruction. So there's some scar tissue or stricturing going on in this location. And this is very different from the next example, which is a, another example in a female. Uh, a little bit lower down uh, in the same anatomy, the kidneys sort of up here, you can see the outline here. And this is the ureter going down here. And then we catch again the ureter down here. And there's this pretty wide gap in, in the anatomy here where there's a, a very significant stricture. And so it's important for a physician to understand because the treatment may be wildly different for these types of situations. And then the same sort of pictures can be done. These are examples in the male urethra of uh, contrast within the male urethra. Um, and so we're looking at the bony pelvis here. Uh, that's what these structures are. These are part of the, the pelvic bones. And this up here is the bladder. And you can see I've marked here this area of abnormality in the male urethra. On the left, it's much different and much more severe than the one on the right. But these are the types of pictures that you get using x-rays. Um, here, this is using a camera. Now we're looking inside at these strictures to see uh, the severity. And you can see going from left to right on your screen, they can vary uh, definitively in how big the hole is that's, that's uh, left there. So let's talk about what we do once we identify one of these strictures. What, what are the options? So, you know, one very viable option is conservative management. You know, if someone is minimally symptomatic, if their kidney function is okay, if they're not having any infections, if they're not complaining about any symptoms, then sometimes all we need to do is watch and make sure things don't get worse. Um, and we don't necessarily need to jump to any sort of invasive treatments. But many times we're seeing people because they're causing symptoms. And so one very viable option is called endoscopic management. And that doesn't involve any cuts on your body through the skin, but using cameras to do something from the inside. Uh, and we'll talk in detail about that compared to surgery in a moment. Surgery does involve making some sort of cut on the skin, but is more effective. And then palliative management, you know, for a patient that's really trying to avoid surgery or has some other health issues, you know, we can keep things open with tubes, whether they're internal or external tubes or some other means um, that, that can keep the plumbing open, but don't necessarily definitively take care of the problem. So let's talk about endoscopic management for a moment. So here I'm going to demonstrate through the pipe that you got in your tub what we do. So we take one of our fancy cameras and we go through your urethra, and we find our way through this scar tissue. And then we have many ways that we can open it up. We can use a laser, we can use a dilation balloon seen here on the bottom right. Sometimes we use a knife that's hot, sometimes we use a knife that's cold. Sometimes we inject agents like steroids or mitomycin C, an agent that we think can help reduce scar formation. Um, but however we do it, at the end, you're left with a uh, open channel through the scar tissue so that hopefully uh, the, uh, the flow is made uh, better. And this can be done both in the urethra as well as in the ureter. Now, what do we know about effectiveness? So, you know, this is an example of a study that tells us that these types of procedures are not as effective as more definitive surgery. So essentially, this in this particular study, looking at UPJ obstructions, those endoscopic type procedures are, are prone to fail twice as often as a more definitive surgery. And particularly in the urethra, uh, we know that the endoscopic treatments are very prone to failure, especially if we repeat them. And so that's why the American Urological Association in terms of male urethral stricture has come out with a guideline that says that surgeons really should offer a more definitive surgery so-called urethroplasty, instead of doing repeated endoscopic management. And some of my own research has showed that we're doing a decent job of following that guideline, but we still have room for improvement. So there's a lot of patients out there, patients here on the left axis, that get a lot of these repeated endoscopic procedures. And so, uh, you know, essentially we're doing these endoscopic procedures at a ratio of 25 to one. And so there's a, a little bit of room for improvement in offering patients these more definitive surgical treatments so they don't have to undergo these repeated treatments that don't have very good ex, uh, efficacy. 
Uh, and so let's talk about the surgical treatments. And so this is from uh, a, a group of physicians that uh, specializes in these types of strictures and all the different colors represent different types of procedures. And you can see here, this is over a seven year time frame that these things are, are always changing trends in what we do to fix these problems are always changing based on new evidence, based on uh, sort of the most up-to-date knowledge. And so this is complicated and that be, may be one reason why endoscopic procedures are still more common because maybe not everyone is equipped to uh, be able to perform these procedures. Now, the next part of the talk does include some patient pictures, intraoperative photos and videos. So if you are squeamish, you may want to avert your eyes for a time. But this is essentially an intraoperative photo of a male urethra underneath the scrotum. Um, and the little hole here that my scissor is pointing to is the scar for this patient. And on the right side is sort of a diagram version of the same shot here. And so how do we fix this? And so one thing that we've been doing over the last few decades is finding new materials to replace the scarred urethra. And one really good material is from the inside of the mouth. It's used to being wet. It heals really well. Anyone can tell you that if you've accidentally bit into the inside of your mouth, almost by the next day, it's healed up. And so what we do is we borrow a piece of this tissue from the inside of the mouth and we fix it in such a way that we're able to reconstruct the tube of the urethra. And this has been a very, uh, a, a very useful and effective way to solve some of these stricture problems. In the kidneys and the upper tracts, things are, are there is a lot of options to fix these problems. If it's the lower part of the ureter where it's connecting into the bladder, we can borrow a piece of the bladder and we can move that sort of up and tubularize that to help bridge any gaps. Um, there are other more aggressive options that sometimes we need to employ, such as an auto transplant, using a piece of bowel or ileum to completely uh, replace part of the ureter. Or if we catch things too late or it doesn't make a lot of sense for one's health to salvage the situation, sometimes we actually just decide in, in partnership with our patients to remove a kidney if it's not worth fixing it. So, you know, one thing that's been really great over the last few years is we've been applying our knowledge of using buckle in the urethra and our wonderful new robotic technology to fix types of injuries in the ureter that we've never been able to do before in a minimally invasive way. And part of the reason why we've been successful is because of this firefly fluorescence imaging technology, which has really been uh, helpful in us in doing these surgeries. So this substance ICG gets injected into your bloodstream. It binds with the blood and we have a special camera, essentially a laser that excites it so that we can see it. And so let me give a demonstration of how this works. So in this picture, you can see the aorta, a major blood vessel in the body. I've outlined for you the ureter, and then above there is a close structure of the ureter, the gonadal vein. And in this video, you're gonna see that um, we're going to turn on the special light in a moment, and the screen will go black and white, as you see here. And you're gonna start to see the fluorescence uh, green of blood flow. So you're actually seeing where blood is flowing through the body. And you can see blood vessels show up very well. And what I have with the rubber band is the ureter. And I'm looking to see how well the blood supply I can visualize in the ureter to help decide what part needs to be repaired. Um, and so this has been very helpful in, in our practice. Um, and so using these new what's called um, robotic assisted uh, buccal ureteroplasty, uh, we recently have been very successful at treating these problems uh, with these minimally invasive approaches using buckle with very good success. And, uh, and we've been doing that here at Hopkins and it's been working well so far. So once you're treated, what's sort of the follow-up regimen? What, what should we look out for? What are some issues that patients worry about? So right after surgery, all these surgeries involve some sort of tube or catheter as things are healing up. And, you know, I've looked at least in the male population about what patients talk to each other online about after a surgery like this. And most people are bothered by the catheter. And that's a temporary issue, but it is quite bothersome. Uh, there's pain, of course, from having a surgery. And then once the tubes come out, there's new urinary patterns. You know, if you think about if you've been urinating through a small hole for five, 10 years, 
all of a sudden you have a big wide open pipe, your bladder may take a bit to kind of get used to the new dynamic. Um, particularly in men, there can be some sexual dysfunction. There's a risk of urinary tract infection. There can be changes to the way that your kidney functions. If we do use any sort of tissue from the mouth, it can affect your mouth. You, you may not be able to do a Big Mac, huge bite, huge yawn for a little while as your, as your mouth heals. Um, and then these scars inside the urinary tract can come back. But one great measure of success are these types of pictures. We can repeat them after the surgery. And you can see in these cases that you almost can't even tell where the surgery took place because the tubes that were once very narrow are nice and wide open. So how do we uh, follow up patients? Um, after these surgeries? Well, we have to take into account, you know, concerns of the surgeon, but also concerns of the patient. You know, most of the time, these issues are not cancer. So, you know, once they're cured, you know, a patient doesn't need necessarily uh, regular surveillance. Is, even if the surgeon wants to make sure the patient's doing okay, we have to consider the cost to the patient, you know, anxiety for, you know, additional diagnostic testing um, and distance. Although with telemedicine, doing follow-up after a repair is, oh, is easier and easier these days. In my practice, if I'm doing an upper tract reconstruction, I want to make sure that the kidney is doing okay for at least one year after a surgery. I follow that with imaging. I do surveys for my patients to make sure that they're subjectively doing okay. And similarly, in the lower track, we have non-invasive testing that we can use as well as quality of life type surveys. So, you know, essentially, I hope that what we've learned today is that a stricture or an abnormal narrowing of a bodily passage in terms of the urinary tract is very, very fixable. Um, and we have an excellent team uh, here at Johns Hopkins uh, that can help and assist you with any suspected urinary issue, but in particular uh, urinary strictures. And we're happy to help and, and would love to see you if you, if you think you have an issue. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's sort of the conclusion of the, 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 uh, the, the lecture portion of this uh, session. So at this point, um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you can press the Q&A button and you can submit your question anonymously or with your, your name. You can also just email us your questions uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of go through them, uh, you know, as they, as they come now. So the first question is, what are the negative potential side effects of urethroplasty? And so, you know, urethroplasty is a very wide term. There's a lot of differences in urethroplasty between men and women. And within men, the different locations where you do the urethroplasty really matters. So let me just speak very generally that urethroplasty is a surgery that does involve a cut, no matter where we do it. And so where we place the cut, you have the risk of bleeding, the risk of infection, the risk, the, the risk of pain and discomfort as that cut is healing. There's a risk of failure in any surgery that we do. Urethroplasty is one of the more successful surgeries that one can get, uh, you know, in, in surgery in general, um, but there's always a risk that the scar can come back. Now, some of these scars are close to the, to the apparatus that controls urinary control. In, in terms of leakage, that's your sphincter. And so if your stricture is very close to the sphincter, then we worry that the repair may impact the control of urine. Whereas if the stricture is very far away from the area of the sphincter, that would not be a really concerning side effect. Um, similarly in men, and even in women, if the stricture is close to the nerves that control sexual functioning, then we might have more of a concern that erythroplasty could affect your sexual uh, in enjoyment or your sexual function. But again, there's certain areas of the urethra where you're so far away from that, that it would not be a concern. So it's really a, a case by case basis. And that is why getting a very detailed diagnostic information is important so that at least when I'm counseling a patient, I can really um, fine tune the risk and benefit discussion with them as it is pertinent to the location of the scar tissue. Um, so I hope that answers the question about the negative side effects. Um, so is stricture, the next question is, is stricture disease always associated with symptoms? And that's an excellent question. And the answer is a resounding no. 
uh, there are silent strictures. And silent strictures can come in two forms. The first form is the best form, which is it's not causing you any symptoms and it's not causing you any problems. And usually we only find out that those are present because people are getting a picture of their, their uh, abdomen for some other reason. Uh, you know, maybe they went to the emergency room with abdominal pain uh, and it turns out that they have a ruptured appendix. Uh, and, and at that same time, we see that a kidney looks swollen and a ureter looks dilated. And so we accidentally, or what medical term, we incidentally have discovered a problem in the urinary system. And again, as long as someone has normal kidney function, as long as someone has no infection, uh, no kidney stones, and is not having any pain, uh, and the kidneys are, are healthy, then one doesn't necessarily need to do anything about uh, a stricture. Not all strictures cause problems. Now, some strictures may be found in this incidental way, but are causing problems. And usually we find that out because there is an issue with the kidney function that maybe one didn't know about because you weren't experiencing symptoms or maybe the symptoms were very subtle or they were thought to be due to some other cause. Um, and so, you know, it is very rare, but it's not unheard of. Uh, I have seen patients in my clinic who have had complete kidney failure because of a stricture in their urethra. And it was just not uh, noticed or caught. And it became so severe that their kidneys actually shut down and they required dialysis. That is not a common situation, but that can happen. And that can happen because of a silent type of stricture. Uh, the next question is, what happens to the ureter after an nephrectomy? So, so that's a great question. So sometimes, you know, again, if someone has a really bad scar in the ureter for a long time, a kidney may get quite dysfunctional. And so, you know, once a kidney is only doing about 10% or less of the work in your body uh, between, you know, the two kidneys, uh, sometimes we have a, a frank discussion about it's just better to remove that kidney that's not working that well. And that's because the other kidney is already doing 90% of the work. So your body probably wouldn't notice missing that 10%. It probably wouldn't make a huge impact to your overall health. And, you know, some people are actually born with one kidney or donate a kidney. So living with one kidney is a viable thing to do. And so usually when we remove a kidney for uh, low function, it's because we're worried about infection or it's causing pain or some issue. And so removing it is of benefit to the patient. Now, we do not have to remove the ureter. Uh, it, it, there's uh, the ureter will is there's no fluid uh, flowing through it anymore. Uh, we do not need to uh, go out of our way to remove it. And likewise, in a normal anatomy, once the bladder fills with urine, urine does not go back up towards the kidney. So that tube essentially would be dry uh, and sort of cut off from both ends, and nothing really would happen to you symptomatically or, you know, in any way require the ureter to be removed. Now that's a different situation if we're doing a kidney removal for some something called urethelial cancer, and in that situation we often do. Uh, remove the kidney and the ureter all the way down to the bladder. But for a stricture in the ureter, we would not have to do that. The next question is, does stricture disease impact sexual function? And it, so that's a controversial question. Certainly, it can definitely affect in men ejaculatory function. And by that, I mean, you know, ejaculation is another type of liquid that is trying to make its way through the urethra. And so if there's a scar in that area, then the ejaculatory fluid may, may not be able to come out or may not be able to come out at the uh, a force that one would consider normal. Now, when people have a problem identified in their penis or, or anywhere in their, in their genital anatomy, that can also affect the psyche. And so while there may not be a physiologic reason for it, many times men with a stricture also can have some erectile difficulties. And again, it may be because they know there's a problem down there, they're hyper-focused on it, and it even on a, on a subliminal level, it is affecting their sexual performance. Um, 
Also, some episodes where these strictures are due to trauma, the trauma could have caused the stricture, and it also may have caused, at the same time, some degree of sexual dysfunction. So while they're not directly related to each other, they have the same cause. So the next question is, should men who have stricture disease urinate sitting down versus standing? And so, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, I actually uh, recently was involved in a research project where we queried men to find out how many of them sat to urinate and how many of them stood to urinate. Because believe it or not, we, we don't actually know on a population level uh, what's going on there. And men who have problems urinating are more likely to, uh, to sit down uh, in general, I would say. Uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, what's better for you or what uh, will be uh, enable you to urinate more completely if you have a stricture. It's, it's really whatever is uh, in your life functionally working better for you. You know, certainly if you have issues with balance or uh, issues with uh, joint pain, it may simply be easier and uh, allow you to focus more on emptying your bladder if you are sitting down. But, you know, there's no, uh, there's no strong evidence I could point to that says that people urinate better when they're sitting with or without a stricture. So uh, the next question is, are there other reasons why I'd have a leaky bladder besides urinary stricture disease? And that's a great question. And I wanna emphasize again, what I said when I was talking about symptoms, which is a lot of the symptoms of urinary stricture disease are common amongst many problems that can affect the urinary tract. And so uh, a leaky bladder is certainly something that people can get when they have a stricture because the stricture blocks the flow of urine. And so think about it like a pail of water that's full and it has a really small opening. And if you keep filling it up with water, something is gonna spill out that really small opening every once in a while it's just gonna keep filling and keep sort of overflowing uh, because there's a very small hole. And so that's sort of overflow incontinence. And that's usually the reason why people leak with strictures. But leaky bladders can have to do with the bladder themselves. People can have a, a something called overactive bladder. People can have neurogenic bladder. Men can have an enlarged prostate that can lead to those types of symptoms. People can have surgery that affects their sphincter and their sphincter muscle, which, uh, which leads to leaking. So there are many reasons why people may have a leaky bladder. And so for that reason, it's really important that you get evaluated by a physician if you have any of these types of symptoms so that they can uh, appropriately diagnose you and get, get you the help that you need. The next question is, can children get it? And the second part of the question is, is it genetic? Uh, and so that's a great question. So certainly there are some uh, childhood conditions uh, such as posterior urethral valves, which pop up in very early childhood uh, that may have a certainly may have a genetic component to it. Uh, UPJ obstruction also, again, may have a genetic component to it. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, these things are, uh, uh, things that we don't we don't have a, a, a super strong evidence base on in terms of you know we don't screen people genetically for these things uh, you know generally if someone has one as an adult I don't necessarily tell them that they need to warn their children about these issues because the the literature is not solid on sort of a genetic syndrome that leads to these type of scars or strictures. Um, but particularly for UPJ obstructions, sometimes it does run in families and people may know about that and they may say to me, hey, you know what, my mother had this problem when she was in her 60s as well. Um, and so it certainly can run in families. So there has to be some genetic component to some of these things. Okay, the next question is, is there a specific diet I should follow if I have this and should I avoid acidic foods? So certainly there is an impact on the bladder of certain diets and certain behaviors. So, you know, you think about it, uh, it's a, a pretty simple conservation of mass situation from physics in high school. What goes in has to come out. So if you are drinking a ton and ton and ton of water, you are by definition going to urinate more. Um, and some things can certainly concentrate in the urinary tract and can bother certain people. So the mentioning of acidic foods is right on. Some people find that tomatoes or citrus 
or, um, or some of the uh, components in artificial sweeteners, um, in particular uh, caffeine that's in soda. Um, these things can irritate the bladder and they can lead to urgency. They can lead to uh, getting up at night to pee often. Um, and for everybody, these can affect people differently. Some people aren't bothered by these things at all. Some people are more bothered by these things as they age. Uh, it's very variable and very personal. And some people have triggers that aren't on that list that they can identify for themselves. The effect with uh, an overlap with urinary stricture disease is a little less clear. You know, the stricture disease is a physical problem. It's a physical blockage. And so, you know, it, once that is present, that usually is the dominant symptom for people that causes the most trouble and uh, probably not going to be impacted too much by your diet. Uh, that being said, there are certain medicines that can make urination more difficult. So for example, men, if they have this problem with difficulty urinating, sometimes certain cold medicines can make that problem worse. Um, but in general, your, your diet or your medicines are, aren't really going to affect, uh, once you have a, a scar or a physical issue identified, uh, really that's probably the root of the problem. Um, the next question is, is there anything I can do to prevent a stricture from coming back? So that's a, that's a great question. And, and that's something that we're, we're all trying to figure out. You know, I, I think that one thing that can help a stricture, prevent a stricture from coming back is a, is a well-performed and appropriately selected treatment. Um, so certainly, again, I think I presented some evidence that the dilations uh, type procedures have a pretty high failure rate. And we know that when they, uh, when they are done, uh, they don't, they don't tend to last very well and very long as far as the efficacy. And so sometimes we inject some agents such as steroids or some other types of injectable medicines to help uh, prevent or at least postpone recurrence. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we consider something called self-calibration which is actually the passage of a tube to help hold open a scar after some form of treatment. It's also a way to introduce some topical medicine inside the urethra if we think that that would be uh, of benefit. Uh, but you know, a urethroplasty surgery is typically very effective. Uh, you know, in the high eighty. Uh, percent effective range among experts. Again, depending on patient factors and location and whatnot, but it's a very effective treatment. And the way that we define effectiveness in this context is never needing another surgery again. Um, and so uh, that would be, uh, you know, choosing the right treatment uh, hopefully would be the way to sort of prevent recurrence, but there is always a risk of recurrence. Um, the next question is, do all obstructions first start out as stricture disease? And so the answer is, is no. There are certain obstructions that, uh, that do not uh, require a stricture. So for example, in men, uh, the prostate can lead to uh, obstructed voiding with symptoms that are very similar to a stricture in the urethra. And in men or women, if someone has some sort of mass growing inside their body, whether it's cancerous or non-cancerous, it can physically block the tubes from the outside. So basically a, a compression type blockage. Um, and so that wouldn't necessarily be leading to or causing a stricture. Uh, the next question is, are you offering telemedicine consults? And the answer is yes. Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, has, uh, I think, responded very admirably to the ongoing uh, health crisis. And uh, as a result of that, we have a very robust uh, telemedicine uh, uh, practice. And I think if you go to our website, uh, hopkinsmedicine.org slash urology, you can see the options for getting an in-person appointment or for scheduling a telemedicine visit. The next question is, are urinary tract infections common with stricture disease? Uh, they are relatively common with any sort of process that leads to dysfunctional voiding. And the reason that I explain that that is, is because if you have urine that's not ever getting completely evacuated, you have sort of stagnant urine uh, that can't get out because of a blockage, then it's sort of like a, a, a mosquito gets to lay eggs in a still pond. 
And so the bacteria are able to multiply in that urine that's left over in that pool of urine that normally you'd be able to evacuate more regularly. And so I think that's why there's an increased risk of urinary tract infection. And, uh, and certainly uh, it's, it's sometimes it's the presenting symptom uh, that people have uh, that leads us to, uh, to discover that they have a stricture. The next question is how long is the recovery after surgery? So it depends dramatically on the type of surgery. And we've talked today very generally about surgery throughout the urinary tract, as complicated as a ileal uh, replacement of the ureter to as simple as an endoscopic procedure. But let me pick a few and give you sort of the sense of the typical uh, recovery. So if you are getting an endoscopic procedure for one of these things, that is typically an outpatient procedure that usually takes about an hour to perform. Uh, usually uh, you, you, you do get sedated, so you do need to have someone drive you to and from the facility. Uh, usually there is some form of temporary catheter or stent that's left in for a few days after that procedure, uh, but it's pretty minimal impact. Um, and so say if you did a uh, sort of a job where you're sitting at a computer uh, for the majority of the day, you know, most people in, in two or three days are gonna be able to get back to that type of job. Um, if we're talking about a urethroplasty, where we have to use the inside of the mouth, the cheek tissue, the buccal graft, that's a more substantial recovery. Usually uh, those patients, again, they have a cut somewhere in their body, so that makes it more uncomfortable. Uh, there can be swelling after surgery. Uh, we, uh, we do have to leave, again, some sort of stent or catheter. And usually because it's more complex, the catheter needs to stay in longer. So, you know, so anywhere between one and three weeks of a catheter. And so, you know, uh, the recovery is more substantial. Uh, but still, people usually are able to go home the same day of, of that surgery. Uh, and generally, they bounce back quite quickly. Uh, because there's a cut on the body, uh, we usually want people to avoid any sort of heavy exercise or heavy activity at work or lifting anything particularly heavy for about a month or so. Um, and then for some of this, the, the procedures on the kidney or the ureter, uh, those are uh, a little more substantial. So if we're going to remove a kidney, say, that's usually a one-night hospital stay. Uh, usually, uh, we have to have one incision that's big enough to get the kidney out of the body. And so that incision can be uncomfortable. We do encourage walking and we do encourage activity, but again, limiting the, the heavy activity until about six weeks after that type of procedure. Uh, and then for the, the buccal procedures that involve the ureter, those again, uh, those are uh, with uh, robotic instruments. So you have a bunch of small incisions about the size of my pinky here. Uh, usually we watch people overnight one night in the hospital, but because the incisions are small, people usually bounce back pretty quickly, uh, you know, within a week or so. Although again, we want them on restricted activity for a number of weeks. So hopefully that gives you a feel for the different types of recoveries that one might expect, but it really depends on the procedure. Um, the next question is, uh, regarding renal cell carcinoma um, and someone who's had renal cell carcinoma and then they've had a kidney removed and they have uh, 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 some tenderness in their pelvis and some urinary tract infections. And uh, basically they're asking if this is something that we can help with. And the answer is uh, undoubtedly yes. Uh, I would encourage you because you're having symptoms to seek uh, care either here or elsewhere to try to help and, and get, uh, get you some improvement to your symptoms. Uh, so we're running out of time. So I, I think I have time for one more question, but if we didn't get your question or you want to answer it in a more private uh, session, uh, I would uh, encourage you to either email us your question at hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu or feel free to uh, make an appointment. You can certainly call us at 410-955-6100 to make an appointment with us or visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash urology. Uh, but the last question is, um, if I have stricture disease, am I more prone to developing other health issues? And so that's a great question. And so 
I think that goes to the point about the controversies in follow-up. And so I do like to follow up with my patients to make sure that no future health issues develop because of the presence of stricture disease or because of the treatments that we perform to help with that problem. Uh, and so, you know, the main issues would be uh, recurrence. And, uh, and, you know, if that were to happen silently, the worst possible scenario would be that there could be some kidney dysfunction that you may not feel the symptoms of uh, until the kidney was, uh, you know, really uh, irrecoverably damaged. So that's why I like to check on people. I like to check their kidney function. I like to make sure that, you know, that we're not missing anything because sometimes people don't have symptoms uh, from these issues or they have very, very subtle symptoms. Um, and so that's why I think it's important to uh, follow up and also for people to be very um, conscious if they've had a stricture, just to listen to their own body. And if they have any new concerns or issues that they, uh, they do mention it to their physician. Um, so it's been a real uh, a pleasure and privilege to speak to you today about this topic. And again, if you are seeking any additional assistance or you'd like to speak to us, uh, feel free to, uh, to visit our website or uh, make an appointment.